Hello, I'm Kathy Klotz, Executive Director of Intermountain Therapy Animals and Reading Education Assistance Dogs, the Reed Program. Reed was born in November of 1999 when we first brought therapy dogs into the Salt Lake City Library to be reading companions for children. We knew we were onto something great, but we really had no idea what a journey it would be and how the program would capture the hearts and minds of children and adults worldwide. The Reed program is respected and endorsed by educators, librarians, parents, and kids everywhere. It has literally spread around the world, reaching thousands of children throughout the United States, into Canada, the United Kingdom, Europe, and as far away as South Africa and Slovenia. Our continuing efforts to introduce children to the joys of reading and books help to lay the foundation for a lifetime. Succeeding at reading is vital to children's eventual success at school, on the job, in socioeconomic achievement, and even to their health. We've learned a lot over the years and we're always eager to learn more and share it. So we're pleased to bring you this series of videos designed to help handlers in their ongoing quest for succeeding at reading. In this video, experienced read handlers share some of their top tips. I bring a special bag with me that has various um, books in it that are at different grade levels. I use flashcards. I also have, um, I always make sure there's Kleenex along. And the other thing is, is I have some pictures of my dogs. I have my bookmarks. I have my stickers and things. And then my blanket. I have friends that quilt. And I've actually had personalized blankets done that has a picture of my reading dog on it. And they may have the alphabet around it. It may have this particular quilt has read to buck. And what's important about it is that it's something that's washable, so it's easy to clean. It's also very large. So when we talk about the intimacy on the blanket, we need to make sure that there's plenty of space to start with. And the other thing that's neat about having the blanket is to make it colorful and fun for the children. So when they come in and they're not a comfortable reader, that blanket's going to set the tone for how wonderful this um, event's going to be. Around the blanket, I like to put some of the books that I've brought that are at various grade levels. And I usually have the flashcards close by. Because if I have a reader that's a very young reader and they're just starting to be able to put their letters together to sound out words, sometimes having a flashcard with a picture on it um, helps to facilitate the learning process for them and it makes them a lot more comfortable. The other thing is having a blanket large enough for your dog to be comfortable on is good because normally they'll come into the read setting and they'll lay down um, in a very comfortable down position but as the reading session goes on, they tend to relax more, and they're used to that blanket being their boundary of where they can relax at. And it helps them settle much quicker when you first go into a strange surrounding, um, a different library venue, or maybe at a different a special event that you're attending. And so it helps them relax quicker, which when they're relaxed, the children are also more relaxed. Then I always try to put the child in a relaxed environment so that he can ask questions or discuss his family and his pet. They love talking and sharing their pets, how long they've had them, what they're like, what color they are, how big they are. <laughs> I try to draw parallels between the child and my dog. And I especially love it when I get little boys that come on in. And uh, I look for anything I can use visually about that child to draw some parallels. And I love it when I have a child that's blonde, my dog is a yellow lab. And I'll say to the child, this is incredible. You have the exact same hair color as Vincent. Or I'll ask a child, how old are you? And Vincent happens to be seven years old. And I'll say, I don't believe it. You and Vincent could be brothers. You're just about the same age. So I try to find as many similarities as I possibly can between the child and Vincent. The child is having a little bit of a difficult time. I'll quickly turn that on Vincent and I'll say, you know, Vincent, be, there are so many similarities between the two of you. Vincent's having some issues with that sentence. I don't think he quite understands it. And suddenly the child is really feeling at ease because the child now knows, you know, I was having trouble with it too. Vincent and I are so similar in so many areas. And I think once the child understands that Vincent is on their side, it's so much easier for them to resolve some of these issues or some of these challenges. 
when they realize that this is their personal space for this period of time, I can see them actually relax, they get more relaxed, they interact with my dog more, and they tend to be a more fluent reader, and they tend to not stumble as much because I can see that natural relax relaxation happen on the quilt. And once you get to know your students, you know when they're hitting a frustrating part and you kind of know when it's your turn to step in. The child drops his voice and looks down in his lap. I would see physical signs. Um, sometimes they'd start scooching, they'd start moving their position. Um, they'd start another topic of conversation instead of looking at the book. I had one little girl who used to scrunch her nose up and when she started to get frustrated, that's when I would offer very minimal support. Maybe we'd sound out a word, we'd uh, put our finger on the word, or I'd introduce Doc and say, Doc, she's scrunching her nose up, we need to give her a little bit of help. Their cadence will change in their reading and they may come up on a word that they've never seen. And so I give, I pause and give them a little chance to try to identify the word, sound it out. If they're not able to sound it out, what I'll do is I'll kind of refer them to what is the picture showing in the story. Can they identify what that is from the pictures that are drawn in the book? And if we don't have something like that, if I know there's a word that rhymes with that they've already pronounced and read, I'll kind of say, well, I think it might rhyme with and that will help them to sound out the word. Or we do what we call chunk it, where we'll use our fingers to cover up parts of the word so they can sound out a piece of the word that they know, and then we'll have them at, put all the pieces together to actually sound out the word. But I think the most important part is giving that child a chance to look over the page of the book, think about what the story's telling them, because they may be able to figure it out all on their own. And if not, then intervene just to help them enough so that they still feel successful in reading that sentence or reading that paragraph that they're working on. It's most important, I think, to give the child time. In the read sessions, I will talk for my dog depending upon the situation that comes up. If the child starts to struggle, I will introduce Doc and say, hmm, that doesn't quite make sense. Let's see if we can help them out. I do speak for Ricky, but I speak in my voice. I speak to her as my peer, my pet partner. For example, I have, uh, if a student is reading and they pronounce the word library, uh, before they turn the page, I ask them to pause for a minute and say, Ricky loves the word library. One of the reasons she likes the word library is because it has two R's in it. So if you wouldn't mind, let's consider that first R the R for Ricky, and the second R for reading. We've done a stage whisper in my dog Jack's ear and actually pronounced the word or corrected the word, and the child thinks that Jack is helping him with that word. Well, when I'm reading with a child, and I have Maggie Mae with me, what I have taught her are some hand signals, some fairly simple hand signals that aren't real noticeable to the child. But if I simply move my hand a little bit, Maggie will tip her head in that traditional dog fashion. And I'll stop and say, oh, excuse me, Quentin, or whoever the child's name is. And I'll say, I think Maggie is a little distracted and got confused. Would you please catch her up on the story for the last few paragraphs or whatever? And that's my way of checking their comprehension. I have another pause stay where I will have her put her hand right on the book and when I just lift up my hand and she will put it there on the book and I'll say, oh, excuse me again, Maggie doesn't seem to know what that word is. Could you please explain that word to her, tell her what it means, and maybe we could even think of another word that means the same thing. Or perhaps if the child's a little older, I'll ask them to use it in a sentence. But these are just little tricks that I've used or tools that I've used to help expand the idea that the dog is very engaged in the reading. I've taught all my dogs to look. And at the cue look, they will touch their nose to the page. They'll also use their paw in a way if I ask them to show me. If we're reading a book about a cat and we get to a point of pausing and I might say, Doc, show me that kitty, or Jesse, where's the bird in that picture? And they will paw the, the page of the book. So that gets them interacting. The student actually thinks that they are reading. 
we just work with um, elementary students and even your fifth graders. There are those that really think that their dog is reading. So I'm not sure when you introduce the dog and you in incorporate them um, with a look or with a show me the picture, all of them at my experience do actually think the dog knows what's happening. My role as a read team member is different from the role of the reading teacher. I have been in both roles. The biggest difference is that as a read team member, you're not introducing any of the concepts. You're reinforcing in a positive way the concepts that the reading teacher has already introduced. Thanks for watching. We hope you'll check out the other videos in our Succeeding at Reading series. If you have questions, we're happy to help. Please contact us at any time. From all of us at Intermountain Therapy Animals, thank you for your time and dedication to becoming an ever more skilled read team. Special thanks to Pia and Jimmy Zankel and the Laura J. Niles Foundation, whose generous support of Read makes this series possible.